Hi, my name is Jonathan Milashevsky and I'm a construction lawyer at Headless Legal. In this episode of the Build Back Better podcast, we hear from Felicity Fury. Felicity is the co-founder of We Aspire and Power of Engineering, engineer in residence at Swinburne University. Happy listening. Uh, hi, Felicity, and thanks very much for uh, joining uh, me on this uh, podcast. Um, I know you're very busy and you've got a lot of challenges before you at the moment in terms of moving house and uh, juggling other activities, so I very much appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, to uh, talk to me today. Pleasure. It's awesome to be here. So let's just start with a bit of background about who you are and uh, your journey um, so that um, so that we can share this information with, uh, with the viewers and listeners. Sure. So my background is in civil engineering. I never thought I would be an engineer. My dad did journalism and my mum did art. So there's no engineers in my family. And they encouraged me to pick subjects that I liked. And my favourite subjects were art, ancient history and physics. So that didn't really help me in terms of choosing a career. But thankfully, I had an amazing teacher, Scott Adamson at Ohallow School in Brisbane, who said, maybe you should think about engineering. And at first, I thought you've got to be really smart to be an engineer. And so it's probably not for me. But that kind of sparked a curiosity. And after putting engineering as my fifth preference, that's what I got into. And I really haven't looked back. It's been amazing to create the world around me as an engineer. And I've absolutely loved every minute of it. So just on that point, before we go on, so you you really put down the fact that you were very strategically and helpfully guided in the in your, in the schooling at, the, at a critical time of making some open up your mind to make some choices about what you want to do. Absolutely. I really didn't know what to put down for my uni preferences. I had so many options available and was really unclear about my career path. It was kind of like one of those last minute things. Well, I've got to fill out the form. I've got to figure out what I want to put down. I was clear I wanted to go to university, but didn't really know what engineering was, what do engineers do, not even until I was finished my engineering studies that I was still kind of figuring out what engineers do and what they are. It's fantastic. Okay, so sorry, if you can continue on with your, <laughs> your, yeah, your sure. in terms of your background and everything like that. Yeah, so uh, then uh, after graduating engineering, I went and worked as a structural engineer, which was a terrible job for me because I'm not a detail person. I'm definitely a people person, but I thought to be a good engineer, you had to sit down and do calculations all day. And so structural engineering definitely fit the bill for that. Luckily, I was made redundant and then uh, got the opportunity to go more into project management. And that's where I learned that engineers do work with people. They can be really creative. And I loved working at council, doing all kinds of things like stakeholder engagement, working with the local community, but also working with the designers. So communication became a really important part of my role. So over the last, I think, 14 years since I graduated university, I've actually had nine jobs and three different careers. So I'm definitely one of those uh, new kinds of career people that we hear about in the workplace today, where young people today are expected to have 17 jobs and five careers. So I'm already on to a few. And um, at the moment, I've got a role at Swinburne University as an engineer in residence, as well as running my own businesses, which are focused on encouraging the next generation into engineering and also training the next wave of leaders, emerging leaders, particularly in diverse areas, because I think we need diverse leadership in our workplaces today. So before we drift into that, which is really important, um, you were, you've been involved in some significant projects, certainly if I can call them significant projects when you were heavily on the tools or so to, so to speak in terms of applying your engineering skills. I just want to touch on a couple of um, ones that may be significant in maybe size, but also maybe significant in terms of um, changing some, uh, you know, the, the way in which communities uh, engage and work. Absolutely. So when I first uh, got made redundant and wasn't sure where I was going to go next, uh, the project management role was quite interesting. I didn't go into a grad program, which is probably where I should have gone in. Uh, they said, this guy's leaving in two weeks. You can have all his projects. And I got $15 million of projects and I was 23 years old and was quite overwhelmed. And luckily I had an amazing manager. She had been a project manager for quite some time, had worked in the construction industry and was fantastic at showing me kind of the ropes. And the projects we were working on were brilliant. It was 15 years of road projects put into four. So the whole portfolio was over a billion dollars. And I was really fortunate to learn project management in that area. So 
I got to work on projects in Brisbane, uh, like Gap Creek Road, sealing the last dirt road in Brisbane, and some other really interesting projects. So if you've driven on a road in Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne, you've probably driven on a road that I helped build, which I think is pretty cool. That's fantastic. So on behalf of myself, in terms of uh, being a long-term resident of the Gap at one stage, I can almost get down and um, bow before you in terms of <laughs> putting some putting some tar on the Gap Creek Road because it... Um, but I also know it was a very divisive issue for the community. Um, but but um, boy, I used to do a lot of running in the in the forest at that time, and you you know yeah, I'd be eating dust for um, for for kilometres either side of the Gap Creek Road. It was horrendous. Yeah, it's a really important project, and I learned a lot because we had so much community involvement. It's a community that's very passionate about. The, the local area, particularly for uh, flora and fauna. And so we had to work closely with the community and they were doing things like reading the lighting standard and presenting it to us saying, the lighting standard says this, why do we need lights in? Can't we work around? So they were very, very involved. And I was really impressed how council approached it. I thought council wouldn't really care about what the residents say, like sure they say you should, but we actually did work closely with them to figure out the best solution. And we ended up with the design, uh, you, probably know it's quite a slow speed limit even though technically it's a it's a um, thoroughfare road and that was because of the consultation that we did with the community so it was great to see that they could have such an involvement and really positively impact the project. There's no question that a lot of these and I've spoken to a lot of other people about you know early engagement early you know genuine engagement and transparent engagement with communities makes a hell of a lot of difference in terms of the the uh the success in delivering something. So, um, so you, you're saying council really sort of adopted that approach in, in relation to this particular situation? That's right. And it was one of those things that I saw early on in my career as a risk mitigator and having that early involvement was a really important thing that I took on in my projects. Um, I got kind of named like the comms chick, even though I was an engineer. It did happen that everyone except for one person in the in the comms team was female and I was the only female in my engineering team and I did get um you know paid out a bit for having such a high priority on that but it was really interesting to see as my projects did get delivered and did come to the construction phase that we had such great community buy-in they were really on board with the project it made it a lot easier towards the later stages so definitely having that upfront planning and coordination and engagement with the community was a really uh, positive step and really helpful for our projects. Yeah, it's, it's so important. I, I say to a lot of our, con our construction clients, you know, uh, you can either invest at the front end um, and, and reduce problems at the back end, which is in construction law is disputes and a lot of money, or you can um, not invest at the front end and spend a lot of money paying lawyers, not sorting out disputes at the back end. It's, it's where you want to spend the money, <laughs> you know. Very nice. Um, okay, so let's get into where where you your priorities and what you're doing right now are. I know you've got you know you've got a lot of touch points in terms of uh, activities and interests. So can we just cover off on them, um, maybe one at a time, so that I get an opportunity to maybe ask some questions as we go through. Yeah, sure. So I think uh, I've been thinking about what are my priorities and where does this all kind of, what's the starting point for me? And really it comes back to my why. So my why is people get to be and do things they didn't think they could be or do. And that's something that if I'm doing that, if I'm being challenged and doing things that I'm not quite sure how to do, then I get really excited and I really enjoy what I'm doing. And if I look back um, on the different projects I've been involved in and what I'm involved in now, they're the things I get most excited about. So uh, the first thing I started while I was an engineer, I also noticed I was the only female in the team and I got sick of reading reports and thought maybe I could go do something about that. So I started Power of Engineering, which is a not-for-profit, which runs free one-day events for girls and regional students to find out about engineering. And so far we've reached 10,000 students across Australia and I'm not running the organisation day to day, I'm on our advisory board, uh, but I'm really proud the organisation is still existing and we've got an incredible team of engineers and non-engineers creating this uh, this venture. So that's a not-for-profit? That's so right. Yep. How's, the, how's, how's, it, how's this activities funded? So is, it, is there 
opportunity here for you to give a plug or yeah well we've got some, yeah we've got some fantastic partners and that's the only way it can it yeah. can get delivered and we've all our whole team is run by volunteers so we've had people like Qantas, Boeing, Arup, um, we've had some great people in the construction industry like Build Corp, we've had Lane O'Rourke doing site tours and CPB as well. So we really rely on those industry partnerships, whether it's in kind doing the experiences where students actually get to see behind the scenes of engineering or the funding. So uh, basically for every dollar we get in funded we ha have nine dollars of volunteer hours so we do put a lot of volunteer time into it and that's really made the difference in um, getting this this venture off the ground so how long that's how long has that been going for in terms of yeah we started in 2012 so we've actually seen students who've come to our events back in 2012 go through university become engineers and then graduate so right. it's definitely a long-term thing here it's definitely not an overnight solution that was what that was where I was, I was actually heading to. Whether I've you, you you got any sort of statistics or any sort of material that sort of can track uh, track influencing somebody, uh, and and they're, they're now actually working in 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 the field in one of these fields. And it's really topical at the moment. There's over 300 organisations that do STEM outreach and STEM education in Australia. And not a lot of people actually track and measure their impact, which as an engineer seems crazy. How do you know if you're making a difference? Well, you track and you measure it. So what we do is we do a survey at the end of our event to say uh, a whole bunch of questions, but the, the main ones are, would you consider a career in engineering before today? Yes or no? And would you consider it after today? Yes or no? And we have 77% of students who were a no change their mind to a yes after just one day. So we are seeing an immediate result, which is really exciting. And then as best we can, we work with schools over um, the following years to see, did we make an impact in subject selection? We've found some schools have doubled or tripled the number of girls in physics and engineering technology. And then as, you know, as best we can, it's pretty hard for um, confidentiality purposes and identity of the students. We uh, do hear stories where they've gone to our partner universities like QUT in Brisbane, and we've been able to capture those stories. And they actually volunteer back with us because we made a great difference for them. They go out and run workshops which is pretty cool to see that kind of chain happening yeah, that's yeah well you the greatest advocate for an organization is someone who's benefited from the organization or benefit from some mentoring or something like that so exactly. yeah, yeah that's so yeah it's really sick so do you, is there is some of your sponsors which you mentioned have they got any sort of are they opening up any opportunities are you aware of from from for the employment of of people that are coming through this sort of STEM encouragement pathway, if I, if I can call that. Yes, we have seen that. So it is really helpful to think about it like that pipeline approach because there's so many different touch points where we can lose people and lose that diversity along the way. So uh, we focus on choosing that subject selection, but because we have volunteers that are engineers or their students, we then have that engagement with our partners. So one example, uh, Kate Linnell, she actually came to our event in Townsville in 2012. Uh, her parents were physics and math teachers, but she didn't think she'd ever be an engineer. So she was inspired by our event, came along, volunteered with us. And then uh, at a partner event, she met someone from Wally Parsons and actually did an internship there. So we are seeing those connections come through. I wish it was a quicker process and I wish we had more girls coming through. But I think those stories are really powerful that things like this do work and do make a difference. If we weren't running this these events, then maybe Kate would never be in yeah. engineering at all. Yeah, it's, it's so vital. I just actually, you know, and we probably should just, I'm interested in the STEM sort of focus of engineering, obviously from, from but if you actually Google STEM sort of careers, it's it's mind boggling in terms of the uh, the hundreds of jobs <laughs> that, that you that are STEM defined in a, in a very broad sense. Um, and it's, 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 and it's, and you would look at a lot of those and a lot of those would be traditionally only thought of be, to be men. Yes, it is. Um, the, the I guess the traditional image we see if you Google engineers, it's it is changing. Um, we often do have those male um, put 
portrayed as men. So uh, like, you know, high vis construction is one that comes up or often I hear train drivers or even guys in hoodies doing code. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, I make a point when I go speak to students to put on my best heels and my best dress and have some bright colors and say, this is what an engineer looks like. And I certainly had the impression that um, I, you know, this isn't what an engineer looks like. And that's a big turn off, I think, for young people, particularly girls, because they say it's not for people like me. I can't see myself in those roles. So the role models are really important to, to show to young women and to young men as well. I've done one of these early interviews with somebody. I think we had a pre when we had the pre sort of discussion about this uh, Rad, uh, Rad Miller Desic, um, who I think you would be aware of. And something you've just said then, I asked her at the end of it, if you had your time over again, what would you do differently? So this is someone who came through as a chippy in the 1980s. And she said, um, paraphrasing, if I had my time over again, I wouldn't, I felt that I had to act like a man uh, on, on the site. Mm. If I had my time over again, I would would not do that. I would be myself, I would, I would, I would exude all my sort of um, feminine uh, attributes and, and own who I was because she said what she's also found is that as time's gone on is that the, 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 the sites where more and more women are involved are the safer sites, <laughs> are the more productive sites and, and are the ones which the men really want to stay involved in. So she said she, the, the, the guts of what she was saying is she, she, she should have owned, she would own her, her femininity more than what she did before. She doesn't feel as if she should have, she felt she was pressured to, to act and behave like a man. Mm, yeah, well, I went to an all-girls school and so going into my first university lecturer was quite quite daunting. I remember being about 10 minutes late and it was this old school lecture room where you had to open the door at the front and walk across kind of the stage where the lecturer was and the stairs are right in the middle. Thank goodness they've knocked down that building at QUT. So I walked all the way at the back and hoped no one would notice me and I counted the women in the room and there was just 12 of us and I found out later our class was 120 people. So I instantly felt out of place because I'd never been in a room with so many blokes before. Mm. And so I certainly felt that in my early days as an engineer and studying and the, so there were some pretty outrageous things. I won't repeat them here because they're two rooms that people said to me in those classes and I really did feel like I've got to get along with my colleagues because we're working on group assignments together I've got to build these relationships so I did find myself acting like one of the boys kind of paying each other out being mean to each other that was kind of the culture and that lasted through my career as well in the early days because I was the only female on the team most of the time and I would have the exact same as advice is if I'd gone back again and I wish I was myself in those early days because that totally kills diversity when you're just trying to be like everybody else. I was, but it was really challenging because you want to build those relationships too. So I, I wish I had the confidence early on to, to do that. And actually starting the not-for-profit did give me that confidence because I got to explore ideas and different parts of my personality that I couldn't do in my day job because I was worried about what I'd look like and worried about my job security. So it gave me that opportunity to explore different aspects of myself and that would definitely be my recommendation for young people if you're still wanting to explore different parts or try and be yourself more then volunteering for different organizations like the national association of women in construction or engineers australia can be great opportunities to do that to explore that for yourself because um, you don't know what skills are there until you're applying them just on that so yeah you know, I've, I've, I've done a bit of obviously did a bit of prepping for, for this uh, discussion. So I think I said to you yesterday, and I used this term appropriate, I've done a bit of stalking on you in terms of what you've done on your, on your Facebook. And I just look, I looked at some of your, your hashtags, which gives me an idea about, you know, people's interests or whatever. And I think, so you've got your engineers astray, but did I see engineers without borders uh, or some over some sort of overseas engineering type of uh, hashtag? I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm sorry if I'm wrong there. But I don't think there was one on engineers that board. I mean, I'm very passionate about it because I think it's a great way to engage um, diverse people. And I think it's important for engineers, particularly ones who are uh, in the process of training to be engineers, to understand things like humanitarian engineering yeah. because it gives that context. Yeah. Yeah. That was what that was what I was getting at from a from a from a from a selling perspective in terms of uh, engineering. I think it's um, 
you know, it's it's traditionally seen to be what it is, build good stuff <laughs> and everything like that. But but if you've got a particular passion of the humanitarian sort of nature, um, you you can find you can find a gig somewhere in the world uh, where where engineers uh, skills are required. That's right. And engineers make everything that you see around you, whatever's in front of you, like the table I'm on, you think about the metal that had to get mined for that, the plastic that goes into it, mechanical engineers, there's structures, there's so much in there. The world, Everything you see in the world, it has an engineering uh, element to it. And I think that's what young people often miss. And so we don't see that we can make a difference by being an engineer. And that's the real hook, particularly for young women, is when you can see the real world impact and how you can make a difference with it, that's when they get excited. So so humanitarian engineering is a great example of that because um, humanitarian engineers are often working in different contexts, different environments where you don't have the resources like we do have in Australia, um, all, the, all the things available. So you have to even be more creative and you get to make, I think, a really big difference to people. It's in my specialisation, it's obviously construction industry and, and a lot of it's got to do with what we call security of payment. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a payment regime called adjudication, um, which I was largely responsible for introducing in Queensland. And the best adjudicators I've ever come across are ones that are both legally qualified, but also engineering qualified. Because I, I say, therefore, they've got cement in their veins. You know, they, they, they understand what the law says, but they understand what's, what's actually happening on some of the major projects. Um, and then if you get the best one I've seen is, is a female who, who covers that basis. And then the decisions that she comes up with are just the best, quite frankly. They're, they're always sound, they're always well reasoned, they're always well uh, expressed. Um, tick, tick the bottle in terms of the law, but also no one's been able to pull over, over wool and to, uh, over her eyes in terms of what, 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 was the, what was happening at that, at that boring point in a tunnel. She knew exactly what the, the situation was. So um, it's, 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 it's that combination of skills that quite old knowledge, which I think is really interesting when, when engineers can, can couple it with other things. Absolutely. And I think in my career, I found, I thought it was, I have had been, I have been self-conscious of things like being the only woman in the room. And so to compensate, I've gone, okay, well, I've just got to know my stuff. I've got to research everything. And while that might not be the best in some situations, it takes more time. And particularly in the beginning of my career, when I was lacking that confidence, there are really helpful ways, uh, they really, sorry, I said another way, there are helpful outcomes of that. Then you really do know your stuff. You are professional. Um, there are so many women who I think, oh my gosh, if you've been able to survive in this industry, you must be awesome. And those extra skills that we pick up are really valuable, even things like um, a relationship or understand the social dynamic to make sure you can get buy-in, you can get, you know, be influential. Sometimes I feel like it's harder for me to be influential, particularly because I look young as well. So I think there's some extra skills because you might have to work a bit harder. It's, I think maybe the silver lining, if we can call it that, um, of being different in or an outsider or in a minority group in this industry. Yeah, you, you certainly, you know, and, and, and all kudos for you because obviously you are aware that you've attracted a fair bit of media attention and, you, and, you, and you're referred to as, um, and I, I love the, uh, the picture I saw the other day when the ABC rang you or when you had to do a, uh, a Zoom or with um, set up on the, on the ironing board because you're in the middle of a, a, middle of a move and, and that just showed you your, your innovation skills. Okay, there's, a, there's an issue here. I've got to deal with it somehow. <laughs> so surprising I got this call you're right it was the public holiday for Easter it was Monday morning I was in the car with our 10 month old baby who was uh, saying things next to me so I quickly jumped out of the car and they said it's the ABC can you do an interview in three hours and yeah we're in the middle of moving and I went yep yeah, okay say yes and figure it out later and uh, that post has been crazy I've had over 5,000 likes and nearly 400,000 views it's insane and I think that people really did love that ingenuity so the skills you learn as an engineer are applicable in all areas of life not just for your job uh, when you get calls out of the blue uh, yes you can you can apply it there too it's that can do attitude isn't it yeah you know, it's 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 certainly we've got young uh, our helix legal is very predominantly uh, you know, youth based um, both male and female so it's one of the things that we try to uh, we older ones try to ingrain upon the wars that you know we just got to come up with solutions guys <laughs> you know, doesn't matter what it is <laughs> got, to, got to fix it got to fix an issue there's a client with a problem um 
let's uh, let's wrap our heads around it and um, and let's and let's uh, let's sort it out. Yeah. How can I? And just find a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. How can I find a way? That's a great quote. Um. So what have we touched? What are your or your passion points or your current passion points? Anything else that we want to cover before? I don't want. To, I don't want to see you miss anything. Yeah, good question. So I am really focused on attracting the next generation into engineering and the two businesses I have. So I've got Power of Engineering, the not-for-profit, and then a social enterprise, which is uh, actually getting that real-world example into the classroom every day. So we created real-world maths resources so students can have that in their classroom every day, seeing those examples and mapped it to the curriculum. So I have done a lot of work in the early stage and uh, those organisations are up and running. So I've now shifted my focus to more, okay, what can we do to support women who are in the industry? Because we know there's a really big dropout rate and more than half the engineers in the industry are under 30. So between sort of 30, 35 is a key point uh, for women in their careers, which I find quite fascinating. So the work we're doing now through our, our newest business, We Aspire Future Leaders, is all around how do we help women who are in the profession and people from diverse backgrounds as well, not just women, uh, accelerate their career and get to those leadership roles faster. Because after your grad program, there can kind of be that bit of a cliff where you're waiting between your grad program to uh, your next uh, role or how do you get into leadership. And it can be tr tricky navigating that. So uh, while we are passionate about the attraction piece, I think retention is also really critical in this environment too. Have you got any views about, um, or have you got a, a desire to see more women get in board positions and things like that? Um, who, who, who are, you know, who've obviously come from an engineering background and, and all that sort of stuff. So, because I think that's, yeah, you know, it's, it's the boardrooms where the reality is that's where the key decisions are made around, <laughs> particularly in Australia. It's a really interesting question. If you actually look at the stats of women in boards and, and women and female CEOs on the ASX, uh, there's actually more people named Andrew than there are women CEOs. We've gone down in the most recent years, which is absolutely shocking. And then if you also look at the percentage of CEOs that are engineers, there it's about 21%. So there's more engineers than accountants and lawyers, I hate to say. I know here like <laughs> legal but I find that really interesting why are there so many engineers so if we have more female engineers then hopefully that will lead to more CEOs uh, that, that are women and it's crazy that it's 2021 and we've got these these really low numbers so I think by helping people in that first stage to get into that leadership role uh, that's really critical to keep you on that pathway going up it's that um, you know uh, you probably heard around if you get a if someone's getting paid even a couple of grand more than you early in your career then you're on this kind of divide and the divide gets bigger as it goes up and I think it's the same thing here when it comes to leadership if you miss those one or two leadership opportunities or you're not as uh, progressing as quickly as your peers then that adds up over your career so I think that early stage is really critical for for young leaders so just take it so the you the stats say that that from a leadership perspective men currently men with an engineering background are more predominant in key roles than lawyers and accountants and the CEO level, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the CEO, yeah, the, yeah. the, the top yeah. level. That's the same with S&P 500 as it is here in Australia. And I think I think it's also more engineers and people with an MBA, which is pretty cool. Okay, so that sort of gets you halfway where you want to get. At least there's organisations are thinking they want can-do people, which engineers are. So so the next thing is, okay, let's make sure that more, as many of these can-do people engineers are females. And, and they might find their way into the leadership role almost through a backdoor sort of way, if, I, if I'm making sense. Not, you know, as a result of being a engineer or female engineer. Yeah, I think it's a really important skill set to have and it's all about problem solving. And, of course, I'm biased because I am an engineer. I would recommend, you know, anyone goes and has this as a uh, as a undergraduate degree I think engineers and lawyers they do think quite similarly because we do think about risk and about how do you solve a problem where uh, you, you know you've got law and the legal side of things we've got our engineering standards and we both use contracts and so I'm often looking at it, you know engineer I love contracts my husband doesn't understand it but I love it because you can get creative and you can go okay well this is what it says but could we find another solution and could we find a workaround so I think there's lots of similarities between lawyers and engineers and I can understand why why they often do get into those top leadership roles because we're thinking about the big picture, we're thinking about people and managing risk. And I think those are all important things when you're leading a business. 
it's funny you say that. I, I've always believed that from a development of a project perspective, the, the sooner you get critical people like engineers in the loop, um, the better. And that also means that they're involved in um, making some, you know, uh, very precise changes to contracts from their point of view. So, because you can have a problem if you if if you've got an engineer who's who knows the solution, but if the contract doesn't support them uh, in terms of the outcome, well, then that's that's the problem. So, the way to the way to solve that is to make sure that from a, from when they're very early development stages, that the engineers are in the room who are not lawyers. Engineers in the room saying, "No, let's change that condition around to reflect it. if this is the outcome we all agree upon." Well then, the, the contract's got to say something different, um, and um, it's a, it's a great point. It's it's um, because that's that's when the that's when disputes arise when there's a disconnect between what happens on the on the ground and what the contract says, unless there's really good sort of management of, of relationships in between. Yeah, definitely. So um, that probably leads us into the broad. Well, we've just touched it on in terms of the elephant. Of, well, I'm not going to miss the elephant in the room in terms of what's happening in Australia. Over the last couple of months, in terms of um, the um, the issues that have emanated through Canberra, or essentially through the Canberra bubble, in terms of women in, in workplaces and everything like that, um, we've we've sort of touched on upon it from a on a couple of points so far through the boards and everything like that. But um, do you see that that there is a, a sea change happening, or is it is it one of those false narratives that are going to fall flat on their face again. I, I, I'm somewhere in between. Depends on what day I wake up, how I wake up, whether I'm in a positive mood or a negative mood. It's a really interesting time. And I think what's exciting about it is we're seeing particularly young women, not the traditional type of leader. You might think uh, you're a leader. Well, I used to think leadership was when you have a fancy title like CEO where you've got decades of experience or grey hair and wrinkles and waiting for my wrinkles to come. Maybe I'll look older with them. And so I thought that would be when you're a leader, kind of when, you know, society says you are or you've kind of been appointed in a leadership role. And what I think is interesting that we're seeing in these recent uh, examples of Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins is that they haven't, someone hasn't gone and appointed them being a leader. They've said, I'm not okay with this. I'm standing up and I'm taking charge. And what I think we're going to see more of, it's even, you know, you could look at Greta Thunberg and what she's done. 16 year old sits outside of parliament and then enables this global movement around climate change where European parliaments have totally changed their climate policy, which is really interesting. So I think what's happening is we've got people who are no longer okay with where the world's going and they kind of don't really, I mean, I'm sure they do care about what people think of them, but they're kind of going down these paths of no return where they're putting themselves on the line, the rest of their future and their career and saying, this is no longer okay. And I think that's incredibly brave and courageous of them. And also I think a really exciting time for leadership and for young people to step up into, into these roles and what they believe in. So I hope that this leads to greater change. And I think there's, it's almost inexcusable if the government's not gonna do anything or if people aren't gonna take action, then it's going to be, you know, there'll be outrage. I think people will, will not stand for it. So I think we're gonna see more examples of this. And I think this is the new wave of leadership that's coming through. And I think a really exciting time because if you wanna be a leader, if there are things that you're passionate about, then this is the time to actually really go for it and make the change you wanna see. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. There's a couple of things that 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 um, I've noted in recent times. Clearly, um, social media means that uh, as individuals, you know, you can control the narrative. You don't have to work through the traditional media outlets, which, quite frankly, can be blockages and, and male dominated. Um, so there's there's that. But but you know, you, you see. Brittany Higgins is committing to writing a book now where, you know, 50% of the profit's going to go to a particular charity organisation. So that's, you know, she's, she's just, ma she's making her own rules up. She's, she's just, she's just saying, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm, you know, it's almost like I'm going to turn this horrendous experience into the best positive outcomes I can achieve, potentially not for herself, because I'd argue that she's opening herself up to all sorts of personal, um, you know, horrendous, trolling and things like that but she's doing it for, for others essentially she's doing it for the and showing young women that you know you 
you, you don't have to take this nonsense and, and you can do something about yourselves and you don't have to work through the traditional hierarchy or uh, anything like that. Mm, it's a really interesting, I'm so glad you said around Blake breaking the rules. I think that's a great framing of it. And it's it's this balance of they're breaking rules by going, stuff this, I'm going to go do something different. And then at the same time, what I think is fascinating is they're leveraging some of the traditional things, like you did say the media or um, the different structures that we have. Uh, another great example, I think, is AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in America, how she got into, you know, she would be the most unlikely person, young Hispanic female, she's 29 years old when she got elected, um, unseated this guy who was, yeah, an old white dude, very, you know, the traditional kind of parliamentarian type person. Uh, in 2019, she was the second most popular politician after Donald Trump, which, is wild and how cool is that that we're seeing people like her come to the fore so they're doing this balance of breaking the rules and then also being really clever in leveraging some of those traditional structures which i think is pretty cool yeah no it's so true and she's you know you know i follow politics a fair bit and uh, so she's interesting when you look at the way she she almost uh, avoids traditional media she doesn't need um the media, you know, I see her on CNN occasionally, but quite frankly, you you, you don't you don't see her. She she she's got her own narrative through her own megaphones, mm -hmm. through her own communities, through her own social media, through and it's 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 like, well, I don't need I don't need the traditional. You know, not only did I displace a traditional politician, I'm not going to go anywhere near the way in which he sort of um, tried to communicate with uh, the constituents. Yeah, it's amazing. She's such a weapon. I'd also say that um, someone like Christine Holgate has, um, you know, for, for, for five months sat on what she was going to do, and then what she did was 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 pretty awesome. And I would argue that that was very very strategic and very 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 effective in, in terms of the way in which what she did between at the Senate inquiry the other day. Fan yeah, she's done fantastic work, and I think setting a real statement and. I think it's that, you know, it's really time. I think people are really sick of these um, toxic workplace cultures. I've certainly experienced that in my time and people aren't going to put up with it anymore. So I think it's um, a real wake up call to business. If you're not on board with this flexible workplace, um, right now we have the largest portion of our people in the workplace are millennials. And by 2025, it's going to be 75% of our workplace. There's some other really interesting stats like, 40% of people have a boss that's younger than them, which I find really fascinating. So the workplace is changing demographically. And I think these are real like pockets of change. And if people aren't gonna get on board, you're gonna be left behind. Um, and you know, we're seeing that with the, also I was reading recently, uh, the number of years a company stays on the S&P 500, it used to be 81 years and now it's gone down to like 16. Uh, so it's just, it's really rapid, the, the rate of change that we're seeing. Yeah, the churn is great. Um, and it's, you know, when, when I come back to Helix Legal, um, so we're, you know, we've got young, a lot of young female lawyers who are in the, and it's, we, we converge at two points of two of the worst industries when it comes to sexism and everything else. Like we've got the construction industry and the legal industry. So the legal industry had its own well-defined uh, issues, which I've got to say that there's, I'm seeing some tremendous leadership from the law society and things like that in terms of addressing some of the stuff that's that's coming out from the legal profession. And then you've got the construction industry. So when, when one of the things that we do out of these sorts of podcasts is that yeah you know, we make sure that our own people have an opportunity to hear what you've got to say and and have some sort of input in terms of uh what what they take away from from all this sort of stuff so it's 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 how it's it's i know there's been a few eye openers from from podcasts already from from some of the feedback i've got from our young guys that 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 you just you just think wow you know it's we, we, we've, you know, I'm, we've all got a responsibility. We all should be stepping up and doing what we should be doing in terms of um, creating safe, respectful workplaces for everybody. And uh, and um, it's so that's yeah, that's one of my passions. Not just in terms of making sure the industry is well informed from from people like you commenting, but it's also from a, from a, from our own people making sure that they that they're preparing and hearing from from people like yourself. It's, it's really important. I think if we look to something like safety culture, um, you know, many years ago, 
it was not part of our workplace. It wasn't part of our everyday mindset and way of thinking. And I'd love to see things like diversity and inclusion and belonging uh, and equity be a part of that kind of mindset that we have in the workplace. You know, every company I've worked in engineering has said zero tolerance with safety. Um, you know, the standard you walk past and the standard you accept got drilled into me when I was working at Leighton's as a site engineer. Yeah. And if we had that same attitude towards, or mindset, I should say, towards diversity and inclusion, I think our workplaces would be a better place and um, I think you touched on a great point there's so many opportunities for everyone to involve someone who is different or someone who's starting out in their career with different opportunities and that's something that we're seeing that millennials are loving as well giving people that giving them the opportunity to learn and grow and they're taking it with both hands and really running with it and that was actually found to be the most uh, important job attribute in a Gallup study, they said it was extremely important, um, three out of five millennials, to have an opportunity to learn and grow. So it's a great way to foster that leadership and also that inclusion and diversity in our workplaces. Yeah, okay, that's great. Look, I, I'm I'm very content and very happy with what you've, you've unpacked today. Is there anything else that you want to uh, finish on in terms of tying a bow around this conversation? It's been a great conversation. I truly appreciate it so much. Yeah, it's been really enjoyable. I think the, the last message I'd leave you with is uh, what one of our men, my mentors said to me, and he said, don't lose hope. I think it can be a really tough environment sometimes and not every day at work is going to be awesome. And there's going to be challenges no matter where you're at in your career and what you're facing. And yeah, he came on board and did a leadership uh, session with um, the leaders that we're, we've got in our We Aspire program. And that was a big takeaway I got from what he said. And he literally said, don't lose hope. And I think it can be easy when, they're, when we're faced with these challenges to do that. And um, tomorrow is another day. So, yeah, don't lose hope. Just before I go, um, we've got to touch on your triathlon uh, <laughs> endeavours. <laughs> so how many have you done so far? Oh, gosh, I've lost count now how many triathlons I've done. It's probably oh gosh I'd say maybe a dozen or so it's a bit of a passion it's a bit of a side thing but I think it's important uh to have um uh, exercise and a health a health and well-being be a part of your every day so I've loved getting involved in triathlons I definitely didn't want to do it when I started my sister suggested it and I thought oh maybe maybe I could give it a go maybe it's just a story I've got it myself but I'm not a sports person and I've been hooked ever since and it's such a great way to get my mindset in the right place and been really helpful from a work context as well because it's helped me um, I'm not very good at being focused <laughs> so in a triathlon you've got to focus on the thing you're doing you've got to focus on the swim uh, focus on the transition I'm sure you found this with your experience in triathlons too and yeah I'm not normally a focused person so it's taught me some good discipline and focus which I've really we loved. Teaches you discipline, teamwork, um, enduring pain, <laughs> just getting the job done sometimes. You know, it can be as ugly as all hell sometimes. And but you just, if you just get the job done, you get the job done sometimes. You just, just retract to another day. It's such a great community to be involved in. I've met some amazing people through it. And I've, um, yeah, finally convinced my husband to come along with the triathlons uh, with me. And so with our 10-month-old baby, he's um, he's buying one of those bike seats. So we're hopefully going to make it a family thing because, uh, yes, you're right, it can be very lonely. And I'd love to do an Ironman one day. The next five years, that's my goal. So trying to fit that in with having babies, um, I'm sure I'll make it work somehow. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> On that note, Felicity, thank you so much um, and um, look forward to catching up in person one day. Thanks so much. It's been a real privilege. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Okay. Thanks, Felicity. We'll, 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 cut, we'll cut this now, but, but thanks very much. No worries. Thanks for having me. And uh, let me know. If, I know I've got to send something back to Emily. She sent me an email earlier, but um, let me know if there's... Yeah, well, it's just that. It's just that. Yeah. Uh, the you know the, the authority to to produce but like i said what what we'll do is we'll give you final version of everything <laughs> um and uh, we'll show you where we're going to cut it up and sort of have have the, have the bite-sized chunks everything like that Perfect. yeah um, and um we'll share it we'll share it around and um sounds great and um but yeah so uh, it's been fantastic i know janelle th thinks very speaks very highly of you so Oh, that's so lovely to hear. And likewise to her, she's such a legend. Definitely an inspiration I have. Um, especially having twins. I don't know how she did that and started a business. And yeah, it's def definitely a fangirling over the, over the side. <laughs> and doing triathlons now. It's like you, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> <laughs> you just make it work, right? Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. Thanks very much. Stay in touch. Take care. It's great. Bye -bye. To you. 
Hi, I'm Janelle Harris. I'm one of the founders of Helix Legal. Thanks for tuning in to the Build Back Better podcast this week. I hope that you found Felicity as inspiring as I do. I once recall sharing a cab back to the city with Felicity after an event and jumping out of the cab and feeling so inspired by the conversation with her. So I hope that the conversation on the podcast has had the same effect on you. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. The information we discussed today was just that, information only. It is not specific advice. As you have heard me say many times before, I'm not a lawyer and none of what I say is legal advice. If you take action following something you heard today, it is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical or other advice. Please reach out to the Helix team if you have any questions or if there's another topic you'd like explored. And if you know someone who might benefit from the show, remember to tell them about it or point them to our Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn.